Next, we talk about CRISPR screens. So in order to understand, oh, sorry, maybe I should just do this first. Um, in order to understand CRISPR, um, we, we give you a simple idea that CRISPR-Cas9 is a bacteria immune system. You know, you wonder, humans' immune system is like this, right? Really advanced. We have T cells, B cells, you know, natural killer cells, dendritic cell, macrophage, all different things, you know, like planes, uh, tank, and uh, aircraft carrier, everything. Bacteria is a single cell organism. How does it have immune system? Um, you know, you, you can imagine the bacteria, even though it's very primitive, it still have a pretty interesting immune system. Um, you probably have seen this in, you know, some early high school biology class, where this is a bacteria cell, and this is a bacteria phage. And when the bacteria phage infected the cell, it will leave the protein shell outside and insert its DNA into the infected cell, and then it will hijack the, the infected cell to make more copies of the DNA and RNA and make the protein, then repackage into the virus and lice the cell open and infect other cells, right? So this is what we know about um, virus. Interestingly, um, bacteria have learned, you know, evolved over time to deal with this viral infection. And the way it does this is um, if there are sequences that are unique on the virus, if supposedly this bacteria is able to survive this viral attack, it will try to identify a piece of unique viral DNA and then insert this DNA into a DNA cassette of the bacteria genome. You, so people first discovered this by looking at when they sequence the bacteria genome, they notice that in the bacteria genome, there are these little, you know, repeat sequences, which is kind of interesting. It turns out this is kind of a police station for the bacteria. Uh, imagine you have a, a viral DNA, this is kind of a little alien, and then it will kind of keep a copy of the alien. Um, interesting, so each is like a cell, right? It's, they lock up the bad guys. Um, this is the earlier uh, viral infection that somehow this bacteria cell was able to survive from. This is a second alien attack, third alien attack, fourth, you know, different virus. And so the newest virus attack is always put at the front of this cassette, this repeat sequence. Um, so so the, the repeat, I think, is the, the, the wall of the, the, the prison cells, right? So that's the repeat. Um, and uh, um, in the um, so this, this whole array is on the DNA, and the RNA will be made on this, um, will be made, uh, you can imagine those as photocopies of the bad guys, you know, you keep many photos, and always the newest bad the alien, you will make more copies of the RNA for this. And so, uh, so this is the CRISPR part. The Cas is actually the bacteria protein, which is like a policeman, and this policeman will you know, go to work in the police station every day to say, hey, or to say, um, what should I do? Um, the police station will say, well, take a photo of the bad guy and help me patrol the cell. And next time you see something like this, kill it. And so um, basically the, the Cas9, which is a protein, will take a photo of the bad, bad guy, which is, is the RNA and then patrol the cell inside. And next time, if the bacteria cell, um, sorry, if the virus infect the bacteria again, uh, this piece of DNA, as RNA, will look very similar to the DNA on the virus. Cas9 will recognize this and say, ah, oh, this, this virus comes again. And once the sequence matched, it will cut the viral DNA into pieces. And so this is an adaptive immune system. The first time when the bacteria, uh, in, when the virus infected the bacteria, it remembers, you know, what an alien looks like, and it will make copies of this for the Cas9 to patrol. And the next time when the virus infects again, once the sequence match up, it will kill, the, it, will, it will cut up the, the viral DNA. And so, the question is, if the bacteria have this DNA in its own DNA in the, 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 the police station. Why does Cas9 not cut it 
its own genome. This is because um, on the target, which is on the, back, uh, on the virus, this is the target sequence, which is the Cas9, uh, this photo, this RNA that match up to. And after that, it, there is a sequence called PAM, which is only on the bacteria sequence. Uh, for Cas9, this PAM sequence is NGG. You can see here, it's NGG sequence. Once the, uh, the, this piece of DNA is inserted, uh, to, to, uh, inserted into the bacteria sequence, it will contain just the green sequence, but not the PAM sequence, the NGG sequence. Therefore, even though this photo is matching well to the target sequence also on the bacteria genome, because the bacteria genome doesn't have the PAM, Cas9 actually does not make the cut. Whereas the virus will, will have the green sequence match followed by an NGG, and that's when Cas9 will make the cutting. Okay, so that's how Cas9 works. And this whole bacteria uh, immune system was um, figured out by people who study bacteria, such as uh, initially um, Jennifer Dodna and Emmanuel Charpentier. Um, but uh, this was later discovered uh, as a potential mechanism to be introduced in humans. You can imagine all we need is a Cas9, which is a protein, and the guide RNA, which is CRISPR. So you can imagine uh, if I want to kill a gene in the genome or knock out the gene in the genome, all I need to do is to introduce the cell a Cas9 protein and the, a guide RNA that is matching up to um, the, the target sequence I want to, to reach. And so then this, this RNA will guide my Cas9 to the genomic location and make the cut. And this is a double-stranded DNA cut and two things can happen. If we make a cut, the cell actually knows that two loose ends, this is not good. They're just trying to stitch the two loose ends together because the cut happens in place. Very often, two loose ends will, will in, kind of immediately be fixed again. Um, but during this, uh, uh, this um, two ends stitching together, there could be insertions and deletions and also mutations that, that happens in here, which is no longer the original sequence. Um, and uh, if this happened to be on the axon of a gene, especially if it creates an indel which will create a frame shift mutation, then the function of this gene will be knocked out, you know, depending on where you cut on the gene. If it's an important location and the repair is not right, this gene will lose its function. So this creates an effective gene knockout. On the right side is a different situation. If you make the cut, but you also provide some template, so you can provide some plasmid that have abundant DNA sequences um, from outside. On the left, this looks like the original DNA. On the left, on the right, this looks like things on the right, but in the middle, you have some DNA changes, you create your own sequence. And the cell will use the template you provide to, to uh, fix this, um, the breakage. And in this case, you can change the basis. You know, you can use this to do real gene editing, to change from one base to another. You can insert another sequence in there. Uh, the, the key is to be able to make the cut at a precise location and then provide the template with the left and right all matching to the cut location, then a small percentage of cells will get the sequence in. And so um, you can imagine if people have some mutations which cause a disease, you don't necessarily need to fix all their cells. Um, say they cannot produce an important protein, as long as you make the fix so that 10% of the cells can produce the right protein, maybe the patient will already be cured. Um, you can even imagine starting from a lizard, gradually doing gene editing and eventually create a T-Rex, right? So these are definitely possibilities now. Um, actually, CRISPR is done one at a time. You knock out one uh, location at a time. But recently, people are also doing CRISPR in high throughput setting as CRISPR screens. And so this... Um, it works like this. You, you grow millions of cells together in one petri dish, right? So 
Um, and in different cells, uh, the cell take up a different CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out different genes. And because of the gene it knocks out, um, when you grow the cell, some cells will grow faster uh, and, and some cells will grow slower. Um, and it, the question is at the end, we, we, we want to see you know, what gene makes the cell grow faster, what genes makes the cell grow slower. We want to do, grow all the cells together so that it can you know, be very easy to do these type of CRISPR screens. And the way to understand how knocking out different genes would influence different cell growth is, uh, let's use this analogy. So supposedly, we want to knock out the two different genes. Uh, in some cells, we want to knock out the, the Stalin gene. In some other cells, we want to knock out the uh, Washington gene. And in order to make sure that we knock out the right thing, we also provided different photos. This is on the same gene, you provide different locations uh, of a different guide RNA. Hopefully, each of them, if not uh, all of them, at least some of them will knock out the gene efficiently. And so initially, uh, in this cell population, uh, this is just an example, we try to knock out two genes. In reality, we're trying to do this with 20,000 genes in one experiment. Initially, we'll want to have a pretty even representation. Um, some cells carry this guide RNA, some cells carry this guide RNA, some cells carry different other guide RNAs. So initially, things are even. We can sequence this library to make sure that they are fairly even. But then um, imagine Washington is an essential gene. It's very important. You knock out the gene, the cell is not growing very well. And then if you grow the cell for like two weeks and you sequence the cell population again, the final cell population that still that carries the guide will be few because if the cell carry this guide, it means that the Washington gene is being knocked out in that cell. And if the population decreases, that means the Washington gene is very, very important for cell growth or proliferation. And if you knock out this important gene, the cell is not happy, so they reduce in number. Um, in, com in comparison, supposedly, uh, Stalin is normally suppressing the cell growth. And now you knock out the gene, then the cell can grow a lot. At the, the final cell population, there will be many cells carrying the a Stalin photo, the guide RNA, which means that this gene prevents cell growth. And so you can imagine um, at the end, you want to know this effect, we, we ask each cell to show us your photo, to, to do high throughput sequencing of the guide RNA within every cell. And that will tell us initially things are fairly even, and afterwards, you know, some genes, you will see that the cells carrying the guide targeting that gene to decrease, whereas for some other cells, you can see the, the, uh, the cells carrying the, the guide RNA, knocking out other genes really increase, and that will give us, you know, whether the gene is functional or not. And so this is an um, example for, uh, this is the Broad Institute, by this time they have over a thousand cancer cell lines, but they have done CRISPR screening in a few hundred of those cells. And because of uh, the, the cancer cell lines have also been profiled for mutation and gene expression, um, you can see from this project, which is called DAPMAP, you can see what are some of the cancer specific essential genes. And I just show one example here. On the X axis is the essentiality of HER2. Um, in this case, you can see here, the guide that ha what we call in this case is Washington gene is negatively selected. Negative selection means that this gene is essential. You knock it out, the cell will grow slower. Uh, whereas the Stalin gene is positively selected because you knock out the gene, the cell is growing even faster. And so you can imagine in a cancer setting, this might be a oncogene and this might be a tumor suppressor, right? Um, and so you can see here, HER2 is an oncogene because uh, the y-axis is the HER2 expression. You can see here when HER2 expression is very high, it's very important because in the cell lines where HER2 expression is higher, when you knock out the, the gene, the cell is growing much, much slower. So the, it's negative, it's very strongly negatively selected, right? So this kind of give you a hint. 
that HER2 is potentially an oncogene. And so you can look into this to see um, what kind of um, can, uh, cancer specific essential genes are. Um, HER2 is indeed an oncogene, but you can imagine there are many housekeeping genes in here that are also negatively selected um, because uh, say ribosomal genes, if you knock out ribosome, you know, it's like not cut off somebody's head, they're gonna be dead regardless. Those are not the genes we want to discover. Um, the, the genes that are pan-lethal, meaning that every cell needs this gene, you cannot target this in cancer. But there are some other genes, in most of the cells is okay, but maybe in just some unique cancer cells that have some mutations, then suddenly a gene become very essential. That's a really good drug target to develop to say, ah, if the cancer has this mutation, and if we have a drug that targets either this gene itself or some other uh, genes, um, that, that will be a very exciting way to discover cancer uh, target genes. Um, so currently, um, most of the cancer drugs target oncogenes. There are no drugs that well, can target tumor suppressor loss. Um, so we mentioned that oncogenes are what makes the cancer cell grow, grow faster. Tumor suppressor kind of prevents the cell um, from growing um, without check. And so very often, um, if you have a cancer cell driven by an oncogene, you can pr provide either antibody or a small molecule to inhibit the oncogene. So inhibition is easier to do, whereas if the cell lost something, it's very difficult to add it back. And one way for people to, do, uh, to deal with this is to potentially identify synthetic lethal partners of tumor suppressors. So synthetic le lethality means that in the cell, sometimes there are mechanisms where A and B genes, they are, they're probably, they have a redundant function towards an important uh, downstream function of the cell. And um, so the normal cell, uh, when both A and B are, are here, the normal cell actually is pretty happy. And if you knock out either A or B, the cell actually are okay. They, they can still survive just fine, but if you knock out both genes, then uh, the cell will die. Uh, so you can imagine a situation when gene A is normal and gene B is mutated, the cell is cancerous. By the way, in this case, gene B might be a driver, but it might also just be a, um, a, a carrier mutation. Um, imagine now if we have a drug, um, sorry, if we have a, a, um, um, a drug that targets gene A, in the normal cells, this is okay because you only inhibit gene A Gene B is still normal, so the, cell, the normal cells can grow just fine, but in the cancer cells, because gene A is, is being now inhibited by the drug and gene B is mutated, then the cancer cell will die and only cancer cell will get hurt. This is synthetic lethality, and you can use CRISPR screens again to see you know, when we have mutations of something, gene, gene B, is there another gene A that becomes super sensitive, you know, become really negatively selected? That will help you identify those synthetic lethal partners in tumors. And that's why people are continuing to do more CRISPR screens in cancer cells. You can also use CRISPR screens to, uh, for uh, identifying drug combinations. So um, supposedly we have a CRISPR screen library, we infect the cancer cells, and this cancer cell say normally if you treat it with a drug, it might grow slower, it might even die. But if you give it a little amount of the drug, the cell is kind of in a not so happy state. And because different genes are knocked out, we can treat the compound with uh, say, five days or two weeks time, and then harvest the remaining cell compared to the initial cell population without the drug treatment, you can ask, uh, and also compare with an, another situation where uh, the same initial cell mix was treated with placebo, just water or something, control, no drug treatment, and then uh, look at the remaining cells after the same time. This will actually tell you um, what is the mechanism of the drug? Uh, are there some genes that make the cell more sensitive or less sensitive to the drug? We can actually use it to derive a good biomarker for the drug. Um, uh, this has been really used in small molecules as well to figure out. And also, um, 
are there another drug that can be combined with the first drug, make the cancer cell die even faster? That will give you a potential combination therapy to overcome drug resistance. Okay. Uh, so, sorry, Professor. Yes. Can you can mm -hmm. you go back uh, in this? Uh, can you explain again this process? Sorry, I didn't really follow. Ah, so basically, you have a cancer cell mix, right? And you treat with two different conditions. One is with the drug, one is without the drug. Mm -hmm. And then uh, say two weeks later, you collect the cell. If you don't have the control treatment, you can imagine this resistant cell, not necessarily resistant cell, but in this cell, you can already see the cells that have a ribosomal gene knockout, the cell will die. Mm -hmm. But that's what happens regardless of whether you treat the cell with the drug or not. Uh -huh. Right, so you want to compare um, the cells that are treated with the drug versus the cell that's not treated with the drug to see what gene um, with the drug become more sensitive or more negatively selected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. What gene is, uh, and also what gene become uh, very positively selected compared to the control because those are, those basically, if you, you knock out those genes, the cell will become resistant to the first drug, right? So supposedly um, in the no drug treatment, this is not, uh, is not enriched compared to the original population, but after the compound treatment, in the final pool, you see a lot of those cells with a gene knockout. That means losing this gene will make the cell resistant to the, to the drug. Yeah. That will give yeah. you a resistance mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is actually being now used in many kind of drug treatment. You can also use this in, in uh, CRISPR screens in immune system to figure out many things. Um, for example, in vitro, we can grow the cancer cells in petri dish and treat the cancer cell with interferon. Remember, interferon is the cytokine that sends the death signal to the cancer cell. You can imagine this is like bombing, just give the cell a death signal, and then ask, uh, compare that with interferon and without interferon, you ask what are the genes that are differentially selected in terms of cell growth, right? That will tell you um, how does the cell resist the interferon killing. You can also treat the, cyto the cancer cell with cytokine and ask which one of those uh, will stimulate interferon, uh, sorry, stimulate antigen presentation, or which one will stimulate PDL1 expression. So those have all been done. You can sort the cells. So after you treat with interferon, you can sort the cells by those cells that have high interferon, uh, sorry, high PDL1 versus low PDL1. You compare the two. That will tell you which, which gene really will affect a PDL1 gene expression or protein level on the cell surface, right? We can also do co-culture CRISPR screen where you can co-culture the cancer cells with say T cells. So this, these are unique type or specific type of T cells that recognize the, the antigen on the cancer cells. And so when you mix them together, the T cell will try to kill the cancer cells. Um, uh, it, so, in this situation, not only does the T cell secrete some interferon to kill the cancer cells, but also the, the T cells will attach to the cancer cell, punch a hole on the cell membrane of the cancer cell using a gene called porphyrin, and then insert more death signals called granzyme into the cancer cell to let it die. And so this is kind of, you can imagine when you have a, a plane, a, a pilot a fighter, a plane, which not only can draw bombs, they can also shoot guns, right? So <laughs> directly at the cancer cell. So this is kind of a little bit more complicated than just giving the cancer cell some cytokines without the immune cells. And so in this case, we can also ask in the cancer cells, if you lose some genes or if, uh, would this make the T cells kill the cancer cells even better? Or which one, if you knock out the gene, cancer, the T cells no longer can kill the cancer cells. That will also give you a lot of interesting regulators. They will also give you interesting biomarkers for T cell uh, response. And uh, there's a third type, which is you can still put the CRISPR in the cancer cells and you, you put the cancer, you know, you grow the tumor in the mouse 
um, these are immune competent mice. They have a good immune system and you grow the tumor in there and you, after the tumor grow into a certain size, you give the mice immunotherapy like PD-1. And this mice, because it's immune competent, is like this really complicated, you know, army and the Air Force and Navy, the, the T cells, B cells, natural kill, they're all there. And you just add the immunotherapy and you ask, if I knock out the specific gene with that, you know, at the end you harvest the tumor again, you look at the guide RNA, you look at the photos, it will tell you which of those genes will make the tumor be more sensitive to immune attack, which of the cancer cells will make the tumor resistant to the immune attack. And so you can see CRISPR screen is very, very powerful. Uh, recently, there's another uh, published CRISPR screen where they can uh, take the primary T cells from an individual, from a human. And in here, um, you, you use, they use two things. First, they use a viral infection to get the guide RNA in, this, this is very small. But then for the Cas9, they use the electroporation uh, to kind of get the punch little holes on T cells so that they can take up the Cas9 protein. And so the T cell will go in and, and also just transiently knock out some genes. And then once you have the T cells in place, then you can see, uh, can we induce these T cells for dysfunction? You know, how do we evaluate this killing effect? And you know, you can, you can do also many other things. And how do these T cells, uh, you can do this in mouse to see how do the T cells home to the correct tumor? You know, what gene will help it proliferate or uh, get activated and find the tumor? What other genes knockout would, you know, make them never go into the tumor? And so these are uh, kind of the collection of things you could do with CRISPR screens. You can see, um, you can use it to identify novel drug targets in cancers. These are cancer-specific essential genes. You can use it to identify uh, tumors with tumor suppressor loss and figure out whether you can treat it with synthetic lethality. You can use it to help you build a biomarker for drug response. And also you can use it to see whether supposedly if the CRISPR screen and the drug is on target, with the drug, without the drug, you look at the differential genes, they should really kind of show you a lot of things on the drug target pathway. So that will tell you whether your drug is on target. And also you can figure out uh, what kind of genes, if it's mutated or knockout, will make the cancer cell resistant to the drug. You can uh, look at regulators for immune cell function or cancer cell response to immune. Uh, we can also use it to find novel combination therapies to overcome drug resistance. So it's a really powerful technique. Um, I think for time, we will not talk about the computational algorithms. We'll uh, discuss that in the next lecture. Okay.